my first encounter with uh, Buddhist teaching was in about 1971, uh, at, the end, at the end of the year, 71, 72, where I was doing, uh, I was in my uh, second year of university, and uh, in between semesters, I had an opportunity to come to Europe. And it became like this magical mystery tour of the, you know, late 60s, early 70s. And I was um, hitchhiking between Amsterdam and Paris. And I was picked up with a friend of mine by uh, this man that looked like the typical red-haired Jesus freak of that time period in a Volkswagen bus. So it was all very archetypally perfect in that regard. Uh, it's okay, no problem. Uh, you'd have to, yeah, yeah. And I asked him where he lived. And what he said is, I live in a um, uh, Buddhist meditation center in Scotland, which, I mean, some of you might know of Samueling. I didn't know of Samueling at that time. And um, I said, well, what's that like? And he said, it's the kind of place that you, every time you turn a corner, you walk into yourself. And that just turned my mind. And so I, what happened was I went back to my university in Ohio and um, found out that there was a junior year abroad program it, in Lancaster. So I went to Lancaster, which is only about 70 miles from Samueling, because Samueling is just over the border. And I went there and... Um, went to my first yoga class ever, had my first vegetarian meal ever, went to my first puja ever, and then went to bed for five days. And I couldn't move. And my temperature went soaring. And the only thing that seemed to make sense to me was, you know, I, I ate very, very little. But I liked to just go down and just sit amidst people chanting. I had never experienced anything like that. I was actually thinking I was going to become a rabbi. Um, so this was a rather, rather a departure for me in terms of my experience. But it felt that it was very natural. It felt like it was home. And I've stayed within that same lineage. It's the Kagyu lineage of Tibetan Buddhism. I've stayed with that lineage ever since. Um, with respect to my connection to it, what I, what I say to people in terms of the concept of reincarnation is that I feel that I was born into a Jewish family to avoid being a Catholic priest one more time. <laughs> um, and uh, the connection with Buddhism was very logical because in many respects, uh, in terms of the, the, the story of the historical Buddha, where he was witnessing the... Um, religious turmoil of his time. I mean, it was very much like everybody had their own version of who, who they thought God was, very similar to the kind of fun, battle of fundamentalisms that we see amidst us in the East as well as in the West. And what he came to uh, was that if God is an objective truth, then we shouldn't be in disagreement about who God is. And if we disagree about who God is, then it probably has to do with our conceptions, our preconceptions about God. Therefore, let's just push the notion of God to the side and let's just work on dealing with our preconceptions. Because if we work with our preconceptions and begin to find out why we think the way we do, and we begin to dismantle that process by which we become biased, then more than likely we'll experience God as God is. And really, that is the, um, the story of the Buddha. In my own life, what it was, was that being, raised, being born Jewish, my father was a veterinarian. And uh, what happened was that um, we lived in an area that was... Uh, became more and more um, religiously intolerant to the point where my father was firebombed. We were, his business was firebombed twice. And so we had to move 
we had to escape where we lived. And then we moved into a Jewish neighborhood. And in the Jewish neighborhood, what I found out was that everybody had a negative attitude about blacks and Christians. So there I was, being disliked as a Jew in a, you know, a more Christian environment, and then finding a certain level of, the same level of intolerance in the Jewish environment. And so what I concluded was that it had to do with the mind. It didn't have to do with any religion per se. It had to do with prejudice. And the question became to me is, how do you just break through prejudice? And therefore, when I was introduced to Buddhism, it just seemed to make sense at that time. So I've stayed with the same lineage. And, uh, I mean, you'll see a number of the books that I've done, and oftentimes it's, people think, oh, you know, you must have been to India, you must have been to Tibet. It's a very strange karma, if you will, that other than meeting some Tibetan teachers in London and in Scotland, uh, I've met most of them in the United States. I've had the opportunity to be around uh, His Holiness 16th Karmapa and 17th Karmapa. I ended up being a, um, uh, in, in a certain circumstance, a bodyguard for His Holiness Dalai Lama and had a chance to just um, be very close. Uh, and so it's, it's a strange thing to have um, the amount of connection that we have. Uh, as a family, we... Um, we have Indians and Tibetans that walk into our house and they kind of scratch their head and they try and figure out why does this house look like a Tibetan house? And, I mean, Melanie will say, I think I need to put lintels up on the windows. And suddenly she just decides to start sewing them. And, you know, we'll have a Tibetan doctor or teacher walk in and go, how did you do that? You know, because that looks exactly like it would be in a Tibetan house and we, she's never seen them or never knew how to sew them and she just does it. So that's the kind of like ooey type of connection that we have to the whole thing. But the fact is that since 74, 75, I've um, been very, very intensively involved with Tibetan Buddhist practice or, or Tantric Buddhist practice. And um, that's been the background to a lot of things that we do. Um, Primarily, in terms of day-to-day, -day other than a writer, what we do is we've studied a lot about Tibetan medicine as well as Ayurveda, and we work especially with the spa and beauty industry, which seems like it would be rather superficial, but the truth of it is that what we're looking at is that um, just as TCM, or traditional Chinese medicine, uh, I think began to develop a lot of credibility through the introduction of macrobiotics and macrobiotic lifestyle, through the interest in martial arts, and through the pro uh, pro proliferation of Chinese restaurants and people interested in Chinese cuisine, uh, which means it's all lifestyle stuff. Um, more and more people began to inquire about the deeper healing aspects of the Chinese tradition. So for us, what we think is that if you begin to make people familiar with the more lifestyle aspects of Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine, more than likely the deeper essence of what it's about or the deeper, uh, more curative aspects of it will be requested. So that's what we've been doing. And uh, we make products, we make videos, we write books. And so that's a lot of what we do. And in my spare time, I like to write about different um, ways in which you can apply uh, Buddhist awareness to any number of circumstances and situations. So I've written a lot about death and dying uh, around um, relationships, healing. And most recently in the last two books, the, the, the book that was uh, before the book that Christian was mentioning to everybody uh, about the book, the, the Wisdom of the Tibetan Masters, was a book called The Buddha at War, which really upset people that I created a title like that. Because the idea is, why would the word Buddha and war be in the same title? They seem so... It's so, uh, like an oxymoron. It just doesn't make sense, like jumbo shrimp. Okay. But what I was looking at was that the Buddha is at, is at war with what are called the three poisons. 